My name is Dr. Gloria McNeil and I am the Dean of the School of Health and Human Services at National University. I am a nurse um, and my role is to oversee three departments, a Department of Nursing, a Department of Community Health, a Department of Health Sciences. I have 4,100 students, 300 faculty, and 17 programs from baccalaureate to master's and soon a doctor of nurse anesthesia practice. So we are the first academic institution in the world to have acquired Plane Tree Silver recognition. So what we have done is embedded person-centered principles into all of our curricula of study. Um, and in addition to help the students really get hands-on experience, um, we have developed a nurse-led clinic. There are five of them in the Watts community in Los Angeles, South Los Angeles, and our students can both virtually and on site deliver primary care services to the patients uh, that we serve. So we currently have been in operation for three years. We have 600 patients who are in our uh, caseload uh, and we are bringing primary care services to a community that pretty much has limited access to care. So our students learn, learn firsthand person-centeredness and how to address the needs of patients who typically have been disenfranchised. Many of the patients in our South LA area are Spanish speaking. So Watts um, in the 60s or so was mostly African American uh, demographically. Now it is mostly Latino and Hispanic. So we have ensured that our um, clinicians are bilingual, that they can speak Spanish uh, as well as English and assist in translation and interfacing with the community. And by putting individuals in this community who look like, talk like, and act like them, it makes it more receptive. The other thing we've done is most grants will not um, support capital expenditures, so we couldn't build the clinic. So what we did is we embedded ourselves inside of churches and um, Salvation Army locations and drug rehabilitation centers. So we've gone to each of the CEOs of these entities and asked if there was space. They gave us a room and we converted the room into a clinic. Uh, and that's how we see our patients. So we are where they live, we are in their community, we are at their place of worship. So they can trust us because we're in a facility that they recognize uh, and that they go to. They go to the Salvation Army, they go to the drug rehabilitation centers, they go to church. In the early 1990s, um, this nation was hit with a horrible measles epidemic that killed 167 children and put 3,000 others in intensive care units unnecessarily. These children were not being properly immunized. So the Clinton administration put out a call for a summer of service initiative and requested that we uh, identify a problem within a city that we wanted to address. Uh, the caveat was that it had to include students in high school, in college, and so forth. And so working with the Department of Health in the city of Philadelphia, we identified the immunization rates were horrific. Uh, and so we put a summer of service together to immunize children ages zero to five. There were eight schools of nursing involved. Uh, at the time, I was associated with Thomas Jefferson University and we were one of the mobile entities. So we put um, an old bookmobile into service, gutted it, turned it into a clinic, and traveled around the city immunizing children and putting the children into the database within the uh, Department of Public Health to finish their vaccine schedule. So we did that for a while and I thought to myself, you know what, if we can do this for immunization, what about if we did it for full-scale primary care services. So I became the director of the Mercy Care Mobile Health Care Project. I had four mobile units and we traveled around Philadelphia and the surrounding counties delivering primary care services, a nurse-led model. All of the nurses aboard the vehicle were advanced practice nurses. So I did that for a few years. 
and then I had opportunity to come out to California. I was recruited to National, and at that time, I thought, you know what? The mobile vehicle is nice, but it doesn't have all of the trust and support. It's not deeply embedded into the community. So with this model, um, I elected not to use a mobile unit, but to make the health care clinicians mobile. So the team moves from place to place, the five locations where we're located, and we added one more piece, telehealth technology. So now we're able to monitor the patients remotely. So if we want to know what someone's blood pressure is doing, what their weight is doing, what their oxygen is doing, we can get all of that information. They don't have to leave their community and that information is transmitted to the cloud and we download it and put it into our medical record. So that's the piece that I think is innovative. It's a, a mobile healthcare team. It's using telehealth and it's embedded deep within the community. So I found a startup company that was interested in um, showcasing their products and so um, for a fraction of the cost because telehealth technology is very expensive for a fraction of the cost we were able to purchase five units uh, that included the blood pressure the pulse oxygenation uh, blood glucose monitoring body weight um, heart sounds lung sounds all of that and a 12 lead EKG uh, package we could put in each of our locations and so the individuals simply had to go to a place where they normally go anyway uh, and we could monitor their vital signs. So we don't yet have the uh, capability of putting the equipment in the home. Uh, that will be our next iteration uh, when we have more funding. I do believe that to improve access, healthcare will be delivered in cyberspace in the future. Um, and it will, at that point, everyone will have an opportunity to experience great health. Young people, just by definition of being young, they're very visionary. Uh, and they want to make change. They really do. And so all you have to do is give them the avenue. So when, when I set up these mobile units and all of that and made it available to the young people, they were right there. I mean, I didn't have to coach them or anything. They wanted to be where the action was uh, and they wanted to make a difference. So even now with my nurse managed clinic, I can't hold the students back. I can't even, I don't have room for all of them because it's 4,100 people, you know, to be involved. Um, they gravitated to it naturally and they come up with amazing ideas about how to change the system. Ideas I had not thought about, you know, um, because of their youth and their interest in changing the world. It's just a natural entity that they have. I always wanted to be in healthcare. I never had an interest in any other career. Not, not that I was not exposed to the other careers, I saw them, but I didn't see them making the commitment to underserved populations uh, and um, really helping people develop their health because health is everything. If you don't have your health, it's very difficult to exist. Uh, and the other disciplines weren't oriented in that direction. So early on, I was guided by my mother. Um, she was a single parent, uh, and we lived in an underserved environment community. Um, and she was a very visionary woman. Uh, she wanted her children to go to college. She herself did not have skills, but I watched her uh, develop an affinity for nursing. And so she started out in, as a nursing assistant uh, and because she was so interested uh, in uh, advancing her skills, she was able to at that time apply for a wavered license for uh, vocational nurses. Uh, and she, um, it was an exam and an interview, she passed and she became a licensed uh, vocational nurse. And so I watched her manage her patients um, and the love that she had for the profession and she wanted me to be a nurse. Uh, and so um, I was able to, with her guidance, she worked three jobs to put us through school uh, and um, 
I was able to successfully graduate from Villanova University with my undergraduate degree. And because I was interested in, in assisting her in paying for the tuition and so forth, I joined the Navy. Uh, and so the military paid for my education my last two years. Uh, I was a commissioned officer when I left Villanova. Uh, and I was stationed at Philadelphia Naval Hospital, where I was promoted two more times uh, to a lieutenant uh, and gained critical care experience. Um, and from there, when I uh, transitioned to the civilian world, uh, I wanted to continue my education. So I acquired a master's degree in nursing at the University of Pennsylvania uh, and continued to work in critical care areas as a supervisor. Uh, but I also always liked teaching. I always liked teaching students. So, um, so I went back to the uh, University of Pennsylvania to acquire a PhD in higher education administration. I knew I'd be a dean or something. So that's my educational background. Uh, and of course, being at those institutions gave me some forward thinking and visionary approaches to what I do now. So I'd like my legacy to be um, recognizing uh, what it takes to address the healthcare needs of underserved populations and to be where the person is um, and to not impose uh, and to recognize that we're all different and we have different ways of living and experiencing life but not to be judgmental and to try to be where the person is to address their health care needs. So if I can Im imbue that understanding in my students as they go out into the world, I think I will have left a legacy. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, we are at the Plain Tree International Conference uh, and we are well recognized as the first academic institution uh, to be so well honored with the silver recognition uh, and uh, we're just pleased to take that to the next level.